Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm Michael Hagan from the Class of 2015, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the Class of 2005. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Kath- Catherine Lamontagne, a lecturer in social studies at Boston University who has lived and worked abroad in the United Kingdom, including a position with the Royal Household at Buckingham Palace. While in the UK, she was also president of the Providence College London Alumni Club, and she currently sits on the National Alumni Association Council. Catherine, we're so excited to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. It's so great to be here. I've been loving listening to the podcast. Oh, wonderful. Love to hear it. Um, So you indicated that you wanted to begin talking about your um, PC experience a little bit. So tell us a little bit about your path and your, your path to and your experience at Providence College. Oh, absolutely. So I um, am actually a double friar. So I'm O1 and then I'm O3G. So I have a real special affinity to Providence College. Um, I am from the local area. I'm about um, from about 20 minutes away in Westport, Mass., which is also um, where Father Sicard is from. And we're both from North Westport, which is really wonderful. But, you know, often when a school is down the street from where you grow up, you, you think, oh, it's just down the street. And my mom really said, no, no, you have to go look at PC. I just have a good feeling about it. I went to a Catholic high school in Fall River, Bishop Conley High School. It was a Jesuit high school. Um, and there were so many people from my high school that were at PC. So I thought, oh, there's so many people from high school there. And um, Joe Brum, who is one of, I think, the most famous, well-loved PC <laughs> alumni, his sons um, were at, at my high school at the same time. But anyway, so I, I just thought, oh, gosh. And as soon as I stepped on that campus for my first tour, it was like I was home and in a home I didn't know that I missed or needed. And from that moment on, every time I could find somebody that said, hey, you want to come up for the weekend? I would go up to PC for the weekend. And, you know, my love affair with PC basically began when I was 16 years old on that first college tour. Um, and, it, and it was wonderful. And I had a fantastic time as an undergrad, um, which is why I ended up doing graduate school there. And um, yeah, it was it was it was great. I'd love to talk more about some of those individual classes, if, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. So who were some of the most formative professors or some of the most influential classes that you took while you were at Providence College? You know, I I often think back to, so I was in the honors program my first year. I didn't um, stay in the honors program, but just knowing that there was a place where I was um, celebrated, that my intellect was was a desirable thing, and I met so many other like-minded students, that was a fantastic experience. But then when I, um, my second year, when I was in quote unquote regular civ, um, Dr. O'Malley was just such a star. I loved him and his perspective on Irish history, British history, kind of got those juices flowing for me a little bit. Um, But then I also had had as a freshman, I had the public service course with um, Joe Camerano, who I um, still have a friendship with and, and I just learned so much from him about your faith, about dedication, about service. Um, And then also uh, Margaret Manchester, Dr. Manchester. I think I majored in Dr. Manchester, technically. Uh, (laughs) uh, Gender studies, um, uh, just her work being a a woman that was in the position that she was in, it was um, inspiring for me. Um, but I did end up as a humanities major. I wasn't a history major. I had been a, I came in as a poli sci major, um, and I ended up as humanities. I still teach civ to this day, so I can't say enough about civ. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience at, at, at PC. I learned so much while I was there and, um, got to study abroad. Wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Dr. O'Malley. One of my favorite experiences um, working at the college was actually interviewing Dr. O'Malley about the Irish history of Providence and how his own family history kind of figured into that. Um, and naturally, as as you might expect, he had a lot to say. Um, and and uh, he, he walked me down each branch of his family tree, uh, recalling, you know, what address people lived at, what was around it at the time, where things used to be, you know, typical Rhode Island stuff. But um, yeah. Such a was... passion for, for his topic and, you know, his subject area. 
And I'm thinking about Richard Grace, too, when uh, when I had him in graduate school for the first time. Mm -hmm. And the same kind of feeling, but for British history. I can remember him singing songs that were British songs. Oh, gosh, this is how exciting, how great. <laughs> Funny story about Dr. Grace. Um, I took his modern British history class the year before I went abroad. And, and I actually studied abroad my whole junior year in the UK. Um, and I had, you know, sat a final exam spring semester before going abroad in my modern British history class. And I never got the blue book back. But then my senior year, Dr. Grace approaches me and says, oh, I was going through some desk drawers and I found this blue book from when you took my modern British history class two years ago. And it was wild experience, you know, having just lived in the country mm. for a year, going back and reading, you know, my conclusions about it from a year before um, and just seeing, you know, the contrast between what I knew then and what I had learned since. Um, so I have that feeling myself, Michael, I have to say. <laughs> 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 so um, you're a scholar of um, modern British and Irish history, um, and in one of your particular focuses is um, on the experience of Catholic women in the UK. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you landed on this research interest and if there are any roots that go back to your undergraduate days at, at Providence College? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So I think one of the things that was so important to me at PC and had kind of grown out of where I went to high school is I had a Jesuit education. And then to come into the Dominican um, perspective, it was it was made me contemplate how different in one faith that they are different ways of experiencing the same moment. And I had gone to public school before that. So I hadn't I, I think because I was of a certain age that I could really extrapolate that there were differences and think about them. So that was happening. And I took a course on Catholic social thought that was probably the single most important course that I took at PC because it has informed almost all of my academic work since then. If I had not had that grounding in encyclicals um, and how encyclicals work, moda proporios, um, ex cathedra statements, I wouldn't have been able to do the academic work that I do now. So that was incredibly important. Um, and when I did my study abroad though, I so I studied abroad in Canada because my, my, my was humanities, but my focus was Canadian American studies. So I did a semester at Laval in Quebec, and then I did um, a semester in Newfoundland. And in Newfoundland, I was the only American there. Um, I took all Newfoundland studies, classes, religion, folklore, but I wanted to know more about them. So I had to spend a ton of time in the archive at the university. And it was there that I became the scholar that I am today because I needed to know, I wanted to know, and I had to do really hard work to, to get there. And while I was there, I did a really intense research paper on the Sisters of Mercy. And then I did another one on the Salvation Army and religious history became such a focus for me that I went on to do when I came back to PC to work on Pugin and his architecture, his conversion um, on the English martyrs in, in England. And I think I had had because I had gone to public school before I had enough of a kind of uh, I could look down on it from above and see where I could make connections that were really powerful. So yeah, um, I did that. And then um, later on, I ended up doing a master's degree in London. Um, and I wrote my dissertation on um, the graffiti that was left by the um, women prisoners at Kilnainham Jail um, during the Civil War. So again, that was another kind of Catholic um, study that I did. Um, and, and when I decided that I was going to do my PhD, I actually thought I was going to write it on um, the Jewish community in Britain. But kind of after a year of doing the work, I thought, no, 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 you know, this is really where my passion is, is with Catholicism. So why not follow that path? How have uh, lessons and experiences from your undergraduate years at Providence College proven valuable in your career, whether as a scholar um, at, at, at BU um, or as an employee of the royal household? Well, I think particularly... When I teach, you know, I teach at BU and BU is a massive, massive place. And I teach, the program that I teach on is very much like CIV. It's team taught. Um, I teach the social sciences. So I'm teaching politics, history, economics, mostly. And I think the fact that I am actually doing something that I experienced every day for two years is certainly a statement, uh, you know, that in support of how I learned, but then also, of course, I'm adding new primary sources all the time, but that foundational experience um, and then how I manage a smaller classroom, the discussion sections, 
I want my students that are in a massive research university to have a small liberal arts education. So I am able to do that um, at the College of General Studies. It's it's kind of perfect in, in every way. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so we've we've followed your career from uh, from arriving at Providence College to studying abroad in Canada to graduating to doing a graduate degree to going overseas for a master's. So we've got you to the UK. Um, so tell us the story of how you got from there um, into Buckingham Palace. Okay, so um, so when I, I graduated from PC, I did a master's degree. I ended up traveling. Um, I lived abroad for a very long time. I lived um, um, and had work visas throughout the globe. And then I, so I did my master's, did a master's degree at PC in history. And then I did another master's degree in London at University of London in cultural memory. That's where I did the work on Kilmainham Jail. And then um, I, of course, met someone while I was in London and fell in love. Um, but I had to return back to Boston because I was going to do start my PhD at BU. And um, I, it was very hard being in a long distance relationship. So as part of my PhD work, I was able to um, get over to BU London. We've got a beautiful campus there in South Kensington. And um, I was able to dovetail the PhD work into um, this new life at BU London and also with my now uh, husband. So uh, that was part of it. BU London gave me a job. I uh, worked in the library there. I ran a program that I now teach on in London every summer. And it was, uh, I think, a very roundabout route to get where I am. But basically, like, I had free time. And, my, you know, I was only teaching, like, six hours a week. I was doing my PhD research the other days. It was very isolating sitting in archive. It's very hard being at diocesan archives in odd places. And I'm a really social person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I needed something else that was getting me out there. Um, so I applied for a job at Buckingham Palace and, and I got it. That's great. So um, so what exactly is the royal household? How vast of an operation does that term refer to? So there are five different kind of branches um, that constitute how that how it's run. Uh, I worked in the bit that's called the Royal Collection. And the Royal Collection kind of handles the more museological, the tours, things like that. Um, so it is vast. It's When I started there, it was in the summer. It's especially vast in the summer because that's when we have the state opening. Mm -hmm. um, well, everything's open. But Buckingham Palace is open. Um, the Royal Muse, where the Queen's horses and carriages are kept, are, that's open year round. And the Queen's Gallery is open year round. So that's where I started and that's where I stayed. Um, I was also able to do tours in the garden of Buckingham Palace. Um, then later on in the palace during Christmas openings and things like that. So yeah, um, it was great. A lot of opportunities being in Windsor as well and St. James's. So for a historian of British history, it's pretty much perfect to be able to walk around the inner bowels of these buildings mm. um, that you've only read about. It's It's perfect. Mm -hmm. As a history alum myself, I, I am intensely jealous, I have to admit. Um, so um, I, I've got to ask, um, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but uh, did you ever meet the Queen? Yes, of course. Yes, um, on a few occasions. Um, certainly the, the one that everyone does is that when you get your Christmas present at the end of the year, um, you know, we wait in a big queue and then you do your very deep, long curtsy. You have a word with her. She hands you your present, talk to Prince Philip, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, as you can imagine, it's in the state rooms, um, of the palace. And I can remember thinking like, don't be nervous, don't be nervous. And then as soon as I walked away from speaking with her and Prince Philip that first time, I went out in the hallway and I actually just burst into tears because it was just such a feeling of making history, like that I met someone who was so incredibly important historically mm -hmm. that I had interacted with her, but also that, I mean, I was an immigrant to Britain. I immigrated there. I am a naturalized British citizen. And I don't think that many naturalized citizens have the opportunity to meet the head of state mm -hmm. of their country. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Truly, yeah. Um, I mean, from a from a historical perspective, I mean, this is somebody that Churchill bowed to. I mean, this it's it's her tenure is is it's remarkable. Um, 
So um, on speaking of her long reign, um, on the occasion of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee last summer, marking 70 years on the throne, um, you wrote an article um, describing the celebratory mood in the UK. Um, can you describe that mood a little more um, and comment on the late Queen's relationship with the British public, both generally in the particular moment of the Jubilee, um, or I'm sorry, both in the particular, the particular moment of the Jubilee um, and in general over the course of her reign? So when I worked there in 2012, that was also a Jubilee year. And for many of us, we thought, oh, this might be the Jubilee because you just never quite, uh, obviously no one ever quite knew. And there were so many celebrations. You know, we had balls in Buckingham Palace. There were garden parties. Uh, but it was also the year that the Olympics were in London. And the whole um, feeling in London was electric. But the lead up to it was, oh, gosh, it's going to be a bother. There's going to be so much going on because the British public can tend to be like that. But then once it happened, everybody was so on board. So it was interesting to see that in this iteration, um, this year when I was over, that there was a real a real sense of, oh, this really might be it. Um, let's make sure that we show the Queen how incredibly grateful we are for her in this moment. And then when she wasn't there for some of the events, that did kind of cause a ripple of anxiety. But so it's kind of like there were two different things going on. Like you were excited, but you were nervous, but you were grateful. Um, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same as in 2012. Um, and I think because of her advanced age, also, you know, the economic concerns in the EU are um, very much and have, have been in the forefront of people's minds all of last year. Um, so. Yeah, I think it was an interesting moment. And I'm I'm very glad that I was there for that party rather than the morning um, later on in the year. Mm -hmm. um, in what ways was Britain a different country when the Queen ascended to the throne in 1952 than when she died this past year? Well, I mean, I can answer that as a historian rather, you know, I'm a social and cultural historian. And often we look at that moment at the end of the Second World War when um, you know, Churchill's out of office. He gives the speech, talks about the special relationship and the kind of handing over the keys to America, basically, for, you know, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. But as a British historian, we think about 56, we think the Suez crisis, she's on the throne. And that's kind of like the, the death knell, really. Um, colonial, there's decolonization, which was needing to happen anyway. Um, so she kind of took on this Victorian, like the you know, the Victorian era had ended, but it was the end of that idea of we are the best, we are British, we are, you know, uh, and, and gosh, it's been a long time. I mean, that was a long reign. And Britain is not the Britain that it was by any stretch of the imagination. Some, you know, it's much more diverse. Um, people have access to incredible social services. Um, it's a it's a wonderful place, but it's also a place that's still kind of building this new identity their you know, mm -hmm. their post-colonial identity in many ways, I would argue. Mm -hmm. So I want to return a little bit. I, I jumped ahead. I was too excited to ask about the Queen. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to return to uh, your role within the royal household. So working in the royal collection, um, what kinds of, um, you know, what's what's in the royal collection? What kinds of um, art and artifacts were you working with? Um, were you um, handling the items? Were you writing about them? Um, what, what what kind of work um, is goes into the royal collection? So I can tell you, I was one of the front, I was in a front facing role. The Royal Collection was very interested in that 2012 year because there was, uh, there were so many tourists coming in from across the globe that people who had a background in public history um, were certainly desired. And I had been, I'd worked at the Breakers um, and, and in Marble House in Newport and had often, you know, had, had, I had had number, a number of roles in hospitality. So I had the smiling face, I could speak French, I could speak Portuguese. Um, so I was kind of on the front line of welcoming guests, taking tours, giving tours, tours in different languages, um, specialty tours. I wasn't um, a curator um, at all. I was very much in the front facing roles, which was great for me because I get to be social and that's all I wanted. <laughs> right, right. Um, so what what was one or two of your favorite experiences working in the royal household? You know, I've made some incredible lifelong friends there that in many ways, it wasn't really about the place. It was about the people that I I, I met um, and have, you know, you, you share a love of history and you get to be with people that also love that. Um, but I think probably the, the, the moment I, there's two moments I was proudest of um, in retrospect. The first one was 
my mother came over to visit and we got to see the changing of the guard from in the palace. And she turned to me and she said, every moment of having you as my child has been worth it for this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think that was, a, it was very truthful actually, because I haven't always been easy. And, <laughs> um, and then for myself though, a moment where I had to kind of pinch myself was during the, the Christmas openings where folks would come through and then we have to escort them out through the front door. Um, and then all the way to the gates. And there's there was a key. And I got to lock up the front door of Buckingham Palace at the end of the night. <laughs> and um, in my stocking feet, because, you know, you've worked all day, been on your feet, and just standing there in my socks and my shoes off and Buckingham Palace is a pretty cool thing, I think. That is awesome. So you mentioned Christmas a couple of times. Um, and of course, one of the traditions that the monarchy has in Britain is uh, delivering a Christmas message from from the from the monarch to the public every year. Um, we're recording before the holidays right now, but when this airs, it will likely be after the holidays. By then, King Charles will have given his first Christmas message. Um, can you say a little bit about the significance of the Christmas message and other occasions when the sovereign speaks personally and directly to the public? So my husband is um, a, is from London, from outside London and um, just in nearby Kent. And one of the most wonderful things is that pause during Christmas Day and the Christmas celebrations to listen to the monarch's Christmas message. And even if you are a royalist or you're not a royalist, often most families will stop and listen. And sometimes they can be uplifting. Sometimes there's a bit of sorrow. But you know that Her Majesty was the head of the Church of England and her faith, her Christian faith was so incredibly important to her that it was nice to have that reminder for everyone that the holiday was in fact about Jesus. And um, I, I look forward still to that part of the day where we can pause and reflect and, and listen to the speech. My son, he's six, he, he, he knows that's, that's a big part of the day. <laughs> so the monarchy itself is, you know, this living symbol of continuity in Britain. Um, but are there any significant ways in which King Charles's reign could be different from the late Queen's, aside from the fact that it likely won't run for 70 years? I mean, I think there's going to be a number of ways that it's going to be different. It, it has to be different because our times demand it to be different. And I think we've already seen um, work being done and more work needing to be done, um, particularly in regards to um, racism, um, prejudice, um, a misunderstanding of diversity that exists um, within Britain, that that needs to be attended to, I think, as a matter of urgency. Um, further, um, you know, he has always been interested in climate change. We see that Prince William is taking up this mantle with his recent visit to Boston. And even though he's not meant to have an King Charles is not meant to have an opinion per se, but because we've seen him for so many years as having an opinion, um, I think we know. And he is going to be in his own way making efforts for these interests to continue on, preservation architecture being another one, um, in a way that his mom didn't. And his mom couldn't because his mom was still, or his mom was still very much raised in that sense of duty, we stay quiet. We don't say any. We need to just be the head of state, and and that is really how a constitutional monarchy can function for as long as it it has, by the monarch kind of keeping their opinions to themselves. So hopefully, um, he will learn how to balance that for himself as long as his reign may or may be. Is there anything that you wish more people knew about the monarchy, or any common misconceptions about it that need to be corrected? So. I do think that Americans particularly have a sense of the monarchy that is been predicated through the media, maybe People Magazine, things like that. And it becomes really about they're just some other famous family. And they're not really just some other famous family. They are about, uh, they represent an important historical tradition. They represent, um, again, as we said, that continuity. But there's something more that's there. There's stability that comes out of the royal family. There's a romance to it for Americans. But um, I think that people need to know more historically things that are historically accurate and not just kind of say like things like, oh, King, the, King George III, he was 
uh, the tyranny of King George, um, that people need to know a little bit more about who they are um, and what they really were advocating for, for good or for bad, right? Because they're not all just wonderful people that we should be putting on a pedestal, but to do that extra work and not just, oh, they're on the cover of a magazine. So I want to turn to your book, um, your forthcoming book. Um, as mentioned, you're a scholar of modern Britain and Ireland and of religious history and of gender, among other topics. Mm -hmm. um, and these all kind of come together in, in your forthcoming book. Um, the, the title is Pious Transgressors, Reconsidering Catholic Lay Womanhood in Edwardian Britain. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about this project? So this project came out of my um, my PhD dissertation, as most academics' first books do. And um, I, when I was thinking about my topic, and as I was working on the topic and and developing an idea, I'd always been really interested by converts and who converted, because in in England the position of Roman Catholics had been really problematic for a very long time since Henry the Eighth and. The Protestant Reformation, we have moments like 1829, where we have Catholic um, Catholic emancipation. So I, I think that for me, I wanted to kind of figure out what was the place of Catholics. And it actually, like, there, there were key moments where on Ash Wednesday, people would come up to me and they would try to always like move my ashes off. And as somebody that's from the Rhode Island, southeastern New England area, like this is not something that would ever have happened to me because, you know, everybody has their ashes. So I wanted to know more about high church Anglicanism, about Catholicism more broadly in England and, and how Catholics understood themselves. Because I go to church on, on Sundays in different um, churches throughout London and the communities were all so vastly different as well. I just wanted to know more. I'm just one of those people that I observe stuff and I want to know. Um, so I started doing my research and I ended up with four um, figures, four case studies, Radcliffe Hall and Mabel Batten, uh, Margaret Fletcher, who founded the Catholic Women's League, and she advocated for um, bringing middle class women into the Catholic Church in Britain because it had really been just elite women or um, really working class or poverty stricken precariat class women in, in the North in Liverpool, Manchester. Um, and then my fourth figure is Maud Peter, who was a leader in the Catholic modernist movement, um, which was a very scandalous um, moment in, in, the, in the history of the Catholic church. But I didn't know so much about, but I knew um, and that's the one that really took me down into all the encyclicals. And I was so glad for my background knowledge from PC. I can't even tell you. Um, and yeah, so I found these these characters, these figures, and they were also pious. So they they weren't they were transgressive in one part of their life, but in other parts of their lives, they would have been conservative and transgressive. So they, so they weren't just one thing. They weren't just oh, I'm radical about everything. And I thought that was something really interesting to discover, to play with more. And then the kind of the thesis that came out of all of it was that there's a lot of flexibility in the Catholic Church that it doesn't need to be one thing for one person and that each of us find our own ways of living our faith. And simultaneous to this, um, this idea of lived faith, lived religion had be really gotten traction in sociological survey, um, uh, sociological um, areas um, through Nancy Ammerman at BU. And in Catholic English studies, this um, idea of lived Catholicism in the past two years, it's just blowed up. It's huge. Durham has a program on it. So I engaged with that idea as well. What material culture did these women have in their house? Things that showed them to be culturally Catholic. You know, it's not necessarily about, did you go to church every Sunday? It's about what are these other things that you're doing? Who are you talking to? What members of the hierarchy are you interacting with? Are they mostly Jesuits? Are they somebody else? Are you going to the continent on your holiday? Um, so all of these things kind of came into play when thinking about this idea of pious um, transgressors. Can you comment a little more on Catholic identity and experience in Britain? Um, and I ask because, you know, in the United States and in the Northeast especially, um, Roman Catholics represent a sizable plurality um, or in some areas an outright majority of Christians. Um, how does the experience in Britain of being a religious minority and for centuries following the English Reformation, a persecuted one, um, how does that make the Catholic experience different in Britain as opposed to, say, in New England um, today or historically? Well, you know, I think that's interesting. There's kind of like a, a twofold answer to that. I mean, the first one would be when I'm thinking about my case studies that I chose, I chose Catholic lay women. I I, I, I mean, that was a very purposeful choice because there's a lot of work that's done on religious sisters, nuns and their work. 
But the actual lay women who, when I go to church, wherever I have been to church, I see a lot of lay women there with their families, often without their husbands or their spouses. Um, and I thought, gosh, this is kind of a, a side that is completely overlooked, but in the British context. There's been a ton written in Irish studies um, in American Catholic history about this, but not in the British context. So I, I think you start looking for the lacunas, right? Like where are these absences? And that was a clear absence that I saw in the English context that I hadn't experienced in my own actual life, right? So it was more obvious for me to see it. Um, and when you are suddenly in a minority culture after having been in a majority, it's a, it's, it's a, it's actually a great experience for people to have, right? Because it makes you truly think about who you are and how you are that person. Um, what do you do to hang on to, to, to yourself? And as an immigrant as well, you know, who am I as an American? What American things am I going to continue to do? And my Catholicism is something that you can be Catholic wherever you are in the world. There's always going to be a Catholic church you can walk into and engage with that part of yourself. It's not as easy to just kind of walk around and be like, oh, maybe that's another American or that's another American. But you knew that you, when you were at church, at least for an hour, you could be with people who were like you. Um, in that respect. But I think more broadly, um, you know, church going has um, declined and it certainly declined even more over COVID. But I think that if people self-identify still as Catholic, if there are certain traditions or things or objects that they have in their homes, that for me, that's still sufficient to be able to understand yourself in that faith. I don't think we need to tell people you need to do this, this, and this um, all the time. You know, obviously there's certain things that you do like transubstantiation. That's like a, you have to, but other, other things, I feel like there's just a flexibility that has always been there. And I want to remind people that that is important, that there's space for everybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so you, uh, among many hats that you've worn, um, you, uh, were an adjunct instructor at Providence college for some time. Um, did you say that you taught Civ or still teach Civ or, so I, I, I adjuncted for one semester at PC. One semester. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, I taught a British what did you history, teach? history class. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, British history. Fascinating. So um, was that to undergraduates or SCE or? It was for, it was to undergrads. It was a 300 level class and it was so fun. Um, so uh, Professor Russo is also one of my neighbors in Northwest Port and we ran into each other. They needed somebody to fill in and I had just moved back and I was so happy to get to be at PC. It was such a wonderful experience. Um, the students were great. I was so impressed with the college and how it had retained so many of the things that I loved about it. But the things that it had needed to work on back in 2001 and 2003, it had clearly been working on. And there was a space in my course for me to be able to talk about queer Catholics, which I don't think had really been there 20 years ago, or a comfort with being able to acknowledge all these different kind of um, different areas and perspectives and really talk about race in a very important way in that class as it re relates to empire and colonization. So yeah, it was a great experience. I loved the students. I, um, I felt such a connection with them. And um, yeah, we, we are at PC every Monday. My son plays hockey um, for a team that always practices at PC. They've had some games there. So it's just nice to see that, that, that connection and the continuity um, from then to now and to know that I'm keeping it going in my own family is really, um, is really wonderful. Um, you said uh, that growing up in Westport, you said you mentioned that you've known Father Sicard your whole life. Um, any any funny memories of him, early memories, uh, anything worth sharing? Um, actually, his sister lives in my the house I grew up in, which I think is really wonderful. What I do remember mostly, though, is his mom. Um, his mom, I remember seeing her at mass every week. Um, so Father Sicard would already have been off in the world um, oh. while I was when I was young. But his his certainly his mom was always a figure in church. There were always these women, older women that I can remember feeling comforted that they were there and in their worship. And I never really thought about it until just now, but seeing all these lay women and how they managed their family life and their faith and all the other things, because everybody was volunteering all the time, it sticks with you of this work that needs to be done to help the faith become stronger and to continue. Mm. So Father Sakai's mom, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you offer to students who aspire to jobs or, or whole careers abroad? 
you know, I just did a talk a couple of weeks ago with the International Business Club and with BOP um, about living abroad. And it ended up being a wonderful chat with them. And I gave them the examples of some of the other um, folks that I graduated with that have gone on to live and work abroad. Um, Mike um, DeCastro has gone on to work for the IOC. He is my year. Um, Danielle Petty works for the Gates Foundation. She does really important work in terms of um, bringing sanitation to countries like Sierra Leone and Cambodia. And I just, I, I said, you know, you don't have to get a job in finance and wait for your job to transfer you. If you want this for yourself, you want to have your eyes open to the world around you, do it yourself, like just make it happen. And I got lots of little work visas. I did the, you know, study abroad whenever I could, however I could. And it has changed my entire life in many ways for good and for bad. You know, it's tricky to have half your life in one country and half your life in the other to always kind of wonder like, oh, should, you know, to not be able to go on vacation other places because you've got to go to the, the home country. But when I teach and I can teach effectively and powerfully about New Zealand, about Australia, about Gibraltar, about all these places that the British Empire has affected negatively or positively, depending on what side you're on. Um, I live these places. I can talk about it. And, and that is something that is an intangible gift that my students get from me um, that, that I can speak with authority. All right. Well, Catherine, I could continue to ask you questions for probably another three hours, but we are going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really fascinating. It's such a pleasure. I'm always happy to do anything I can with the PC family. And, you know, again, like I said, the podcasts have been incredible. I have been moved to tears by some of the podcasts that I've listened to. And it's such a wonderful honor to be able to be thought of as on par with some of the amazing alums that you've already interviewed and students who are just doing such impressive work. So thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. All right. Well, with that endorsement, it's a perfectly appropriate time to say subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play and Spotify, as well as your smart speaker. If you like what you if you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening and go Friars.